Hello class, welcome to your session on rationalism and empiricism. This is a lot to cover in one week in lecture, so we're going to be a little bit schematic. Nevertheless, you should emerge from this lecture with a basic understanding of six major modern philosophers. During this period of modern philosophy, roughly from 1600 to 1775, the former unity of philosophy or philosophical ontology splits up into diverging camps. In regards to ontology, metaphysics or the theory of what is, materialist and idealist positions, reflecting the doctrine that all that really is is matter or all that really is are ideas or the mind, become increasingly separated as well epistemological doctrines and methods concerning what we can know and how, whether we know ourselves and the world through reason primarily, or whether all the systems of human knowledge are inferences from experience and observation, as well during this period come to follow diverging paths. All roads, however, lead to Kant, who is central for reconciling these various traditions more or less successfully, as we'll see next week. First up this week is Thomas Hobbes, who is important for the development of materialism in the world of forces and states of affairs. Hobbes is most famous for his book Leviathan, introduces the idea of social contract theory as a basis for morality and justice. The colonization of the new world introduces into Hobbes and other thinkers of this period the idea of the state of nature. More on the figure of the sovereign or Leviathan in Hobbes in a moment. Hobbes's overall response to Descartes is to take issue with the idea that there can be no physics of the human being. Hobbes is unconvinced of Descartes' argument concerning the independence of the mind from the body. The thing that thinks for him, or cogito, may well be a physical body, and Hobbes thus explains the subject in a corporeal fashion. For Hobbes, the materialist method is one of resolution and composition. The first stage, resolution, consists in the analysis of complex wholes into their simple elements. In the second stage, the elements are reassembled or composed again into a whole. This sounds like Descartes breaking complex problems down into simpler elements and reassembling complex problems again from out of those elements, but Hobbes pursues this method without dualism and in a materialist mode. He aspires to be the Galileo or the Harvey of the human world and is convinced that a scientific understanding of human nature will be both a contribution to knowledge and a practical benefit. On life, he writes in Leviathan that it is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within. Why may we not say that all automata, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels as doth a watch, have an artificial life? For what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves, and so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer? Note here, his materialism is not pitched in his published writings in opposition to theology. Regarding thoughts, they are singly, every one of them, a representation or appearance of some quality or other accident of a body outside of us, which is commonly called an object. And the origin of all thoughts resides in sensations, or what he calls sense. For there is no conception that man's mind thinks about which was not totally or in parts begotten from the organs of sense. Hobbes thus reductively understands the phenomena of imagination and memory as decaying sense. And the entire life of the mind is nothing more than matter in motion. Lady Margaret Lucas Cavendish was an important 17th century woman philosopher. As a way of improving upon Hobbes's materialism, Cavendish proposes three types of matter, inanimate, sensitive, and rational. Inanimate matter cannot move itself, but is moved by self-moving sensitive matter. Sensitive matter, in turn, takes direction from rational matter. Epiphenomenalism is the view in philosophy of mind that although consciousness or mental properties emerge from material substance and are causally dependent on physical states, they do not, in turn, affect the physical world. They are nevertheless ontologically distinct. Hobbes seems to be, have been an early proponent of epiphenomenalism when he describes matter's motion as mind, as fancy. Although nowhere in his writings an avowed atheist, Hobbes nevertheless thinks that the thought of God is impossible. Since whatsoever we imagine is finite, we have no idea of or conception of anything truly infinite. We do of course have words for gods, and we can even call him a being of infinite perfection, as Descartes does. These terms do not really function to describe God, rather they are reflections of our intention to honor him. Hobbes distinguishes between the mere association of ideas and more strictly regulated thoughts. 
Truth consists for him in the right ordering of names, in our affirmations or propositions. The seeker after truth must be very careful in reflecting on what his words mean or what his names designate or stand for. This could be understood as a pragmatic nominalism in Hobbes, as well as a forerunner of the truth as coherence theory, opposed to truth as correspondence with reality. When we define something for Hobbes, we don't get strictly at the essence of the thing, but rather create a pragmatic placeholder in language. Against the argument from authority, Hobbes writes, only a fool thinks that we can buy truth by relying on the time-honored words of wise men from the past. Reasoning, Hobbes tells us, is nothing but reckoning, that is, adding and subtracting of the consequences of general names agreed upon for the marking and signifying of our thoughts. In a way, for Hobbes, reasoning is computation, although it can be distinguished to some extent from vital motions and voluntary motions. Hobbes is the most famous for his pessimistic or very dim view of human nature. Human beings are not naturally altruistic, but rather egoistic, their primary concern being self-interest, gratification, and the avoidance of harm. Hobbes breaks from the medieval notion that the state is a natural organism based on devotion and interdependence, as well as with the medieval notion of fundamental inequalities along the levels of the great chain of being. Despite having vastly different levels of ability and natural talent, as well as life histories in which those abilities are more or less realized, at bottom, all human beings are basically more rather than less equal, and even the weakest has strength enough to kill the strongest. Hobbes describes our natural condition or the state of nature as that of a war of every man against every man. In this state of nature, life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. We agree to positive law as a hedonistic bargain. We curtail our will to liberty for the sake of a measure of freedom. Hobbes thus grounds the legitimacy of positive law in his doctrine of a social contract. The ideal social contract is never accomplished once and for all. Rather, underneath the state of civilization ever lurks the state of nature as a state of exception to civilized law and order. This leads Hobbes to his strongly authoritarian doctrine that humanity needs a common coercive power set above them. Hobbes thus describes the Leviathan as an artificial man, a mortal god, the state itself, the body politic, and the sovereign above the law. Although he rejects the medieval notion of the divine right of kings, as well as all absolutist political doctrine, and criticizes the political theories of sovereignty of Jean Baudin and others, Hobbes nevertheless justifies the total political authority of kings or other governing bodies as necessary to maintain a social contract and prevent society from re-spiraling back into a state of nature. Perpetual peace for Hobbes can only ever be a temporary achievement which is constantly threatened by the state of exception and has seething within it at all times and everywhere the possibility of a regression to the war of all against all. For law to be maintained, there must be something that is above and beyond the law, and that thing for Hobbes is the Leviathan, occasionally beneficent, occasionally monstrous sovereign, who holds the state and the body politic together, ensuring that order in the end will always win out over chaos. Hobbes' theory of pleasure, pain, and happiness is also a little bit epicurean. Pleasure, Hobbes tells us, is a corroboration of vital motion and help thereunto, while pain is a hindering and troubling of vital motion. Feeling good, in other words, is health. Happiness, or the word Hobbes uses here, felicity, is not the final self-sufficient good of human life, eudaimonia, as it was in Aristotle, attainable only through the golden mean or cultivation of virtuous flourishing. But in Hobbes, it seems happiness or felicity is more or less getting what you want as much as possible. Continual success in obtaining those things which a man from time to time desireth, that is to say, continual prospering, is what men call felicity. I mean the felicity of this life. For there is no such thing as perpetual tranquility of mind while we live here, because life itself is but motion and can never be without desire, nor without fear, nor more than without sense. Hobbes doesn't distinguish here, but he might, between the different orders of pleasure that Epicurus and the Epicureans did. And his basic point is that we can call that person happy when he has the power to attain satisfaction successfully over a significant period of time. Human society involves a perpetual and restless desire of power after power. And in seeking one's own felicity, one threatens that of others. 
so we are all naturally competitors. All in all, Hobbes can be considered a sort of black sheep of modern philosophy, himself a very decent man concerned with human prosperity and well-being, his material monism, epistemological nominalism, pessimistic theories of human nature, authoritarian political philosophy, and realist account of human happiness and flourishing, all combine into a quite unsettling picture of the world. Hobbes' influence continues to be immense, even when subterranean, and many of his theories continue to be reinvented. Above all, in politics, his theory of the state of exception has been richly developed by more recent political philosophers. The next major empirical thinker we'll be studying is John Locke, whose work overall has been far more influential and embraced by the empiricist tradition than Hobbes. John Locke is a predecessor to the Enlightenment and a deist in matters of religion. He is more optimistic about human nature than Hobbes and recommends liberal democracy, the limited authority of rulers, and the separation of powers or branches of government, first advocated by Montesquieu. In Locke's epistemology, impressions are primary, ideas are derived from them, like in Hobbes. His most influential epistemological idea is the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. He considers the human mind at birth a tabula rasa, or blank slate, and proposes the first comprehensive empirical theory of education. And he is also the originator of the bundle theory of personal identity. Locke famously debunks Descartes' notion of innate knowledge or innate ideas. It is from sense experience that the mind obtains all the materials of reason and knowledge. Melchior comments on Locke, although a clear implication of Cartesian method is that first philosophy is really epistemology, Descartes' own meditations are still in the metaphysical mode. Locke defines an idea as whatsoever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks. Even the simple tautology or idea of being whatever is, is, is not innate to Locke, and all knowledge is founded and derives from experience. A simple idea is one that, being in itself uncompounded, contains in it nothing but one uniform appearance or conception of the mind. Once simple ideas are stored in the understanding, it has the power to repeat, compare, and unite them, even to an almost infinite variety, and so can make it pleasure new complex ideas. However, it is not within the power of any mind to invent or frame one simple new idea. This notion can be understood in the poetic dictum of John Keats, nothing ever becomes real until it is experienced. For Locke, substance is real and does exist, but all of its appearances are ideas in the mind, and are therefore not necessarily properties or primary qualities of those substances. Locke's more extensive discussion of primary and secondary qualities arrives in his essay concerning human understanding, book two, Primary qualities are in the object and in our ideas of them. Solidity, extension, motion are good examples of primary qualities. Secondary qualities are powers in the objects of sense to produce ideas. Colors, smells, tastes as we perceive them do not exist in the objects themselves. They are subjective qualities we perceive caused by the primary qualities of those objects and our sense apparatus. This distinction may seem abstract, but it's really very helpful and concrete, as well as quite startling, if not astonishing. Look around you at all the objects in your immediate environment, and assess all your sensations of the external world coming in through the five senses. For Locke, the shape, solidity, extension of things, as well as their motion, is a real property of those things. Those properties may be distorted by the senses on occasion but they are definitely properties that inhere in the things themselves. For example, the computer screen on which you watch this is either 12 or 13 or 15 inches in diameter. That property is not debatable. And when you throw an object across a room, that object really is in motion. Knock on the desk and it is solid wood. But it seems that the senses, even though they can be in error, for the most part represent primary qualities adequately. The really astonishing thing comes when you look at secondary qualities. The world as such as a whole does not in fact have any color. It is purely the theater of your mind which is producing color for you and your experience. The wall in the background of the video here is not light purple. Your experience of the light purple is a result of light or photons bouncing off the wall, some of them being absorbed into the electron shell of the molecules in the paint. The information that enters into the senses is simply light of various frequencies blended together. It is your eye and brain which provide 
the color purple, not the objects themselves. And the same colors you perceive as being this or that may be perceived differently by someone who is colorblind. This same reasoning applies to smells and tastes, and even to touch what is considered smooth or rough. Certainly there is something in the smell of a rose, the particles which a rose emits, which interacts with the olfactory sense. But it is entirely your brain which associates that interaction with a specific sensation. In this way, Locke distinguishes between actual qualities and our ideas of qualities. Primary qualities are in the external objects, and secondary qualities, or the ideas of them, are in the mind. This represents a major advance in the field of epistemology. On the idea of the soul, Locke argues that we are indeed able to frame the complex idea of an immaterial spirit, and that there must be some spiritual being within me that sees and hears but that as we attempt to fathom what the nature of this immaterial spirit or spiritual being is, we fall into darkness and obscurity, perplexities and difficulties, tending to stumble over our own blindness and ignorance. Locke's theory of personal identity and consciousness has become quite influential. It is our consciousness that defines the self, and our personal identity from moment to moment derives from our consciousness of things present as well as things past. Personal identity does not therefore consist in the sameness of substance. Even if there is a soul substance, it could be that this substance as well changes through succession. Again, what constitutes the identity of the self is its consciousness of this identity, both in the present and through memory. The implication here being that if a single substance were wholly stripped of all consciousness of its past existence, that is, if our consciousness were to become completely amnesiac, Regarding everything that has happened before, this would constitute the end of one person and the beginning of another. Much like in Hobbes, for Locke, words stand for ideas in the mind. Abstract terms present nominal essences, not real essences. Knowledge emerges within the process of agreement and disagreement among ideas. And real existence can be known by sensible intuition in our own cases, by demonstrative reason in God's case, and by sensation in the case of material things. Locke's epistemology and theory of language is thus less materialist and pragmatic than Hobbes. Not only is the idea of an immaterial substance or spirit as clear and distinct as any other idea, but so is the idea of God along with all his omni-properties. The real existence of the being to whom this idea corresponds being something we can know through rational demonstration. So still within Locke's empiricism, there is a role to be played by pure reason. Probably Locke's most famous statement on the nature of knowledge, it is nothing other but the perception of the connection of an agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas. In this alone it consists. This is developed by Locke in a representational theory of perception and knowledge. But when it comes to how our mental representations can correspond to real beings in the empirical world, Locke's empiricism stumbles a bit. For anyone who claims that philosophers can have no real impact on the politics of the world, Locke is a glowing refutation. His version of the social contract theory is less pessimistic and more embracing of a basic human altruism and goodness than Hobbes. His recommendations of representative self-government, the division of powers, property as a natural right, and the responsibility of governments to their people, tolerance for religious differences as well as other ideological differences, the separation of church and state, and tolerance as the core virtue of a civil society and an essential means to peace were all incredibly influential for America's founding fathers and much of Locke's insights finds itself enshrined in the American Constitution. Before looking at David Hume, the arc empiricist of them all, let's take a little detour to Ireland and to the idealist philosophy or response to both Locke and Descartes of Bishop Berkeley. Berkeley was well trained in the science of his day, including the work of Isaac Newton and Locke's essay concerning human understanding. His main beef with Locke was to point out that Locke's philosophy had not really solved the problem of skepticism, truth, and could potentially lead to atheism. Berkeley famously denied the existence of material objects independently of the human senses. All that really exists for Berkeley are minds and their ideas. This is the doctrine known as subjective idealism. In method, Berkeley isn't really a rationalist, but more of an empiricist. But in the content or conclusions of his philosophy, he believes that empiricism practiced properly leads to an idealist ontology. 
For the other empiricists studied so far, Hobbes and Locke, sense data and the physical world are the primary reality and form the materials of human knowledge. Abstract ideas are important too, but tend to serve more of a heuristic function. For Berkeley, instead of exploring the world of abstract ideas as less clear, assured, and distinct than the world of sensible matter, he argued that ideas are in fact the primary reality, and that to be is to be perceived, essay ist percipi, where it is God's perceiving of all things as they are that guarantees the objectivity and solidity of the external world. This seems pretty non-commonsensical, but Berkeley insists that his view is more consistent with rigorous common sense, and that it defeats both skepticism and atheism. What makes atheism both possible and attractive, Berkeley holds, is the hypothesis of matter or corporeal substance as the bearer of real existence. Working carefully through Berkeley exceeds what we can accomplish in a week uh, so packed with so many things, but he deserves an honorable mention for having turned the methods of empiricism against some of the impasses and aporias of empiricist philosophy. Summing up Berkeley's philosophy all too schematically, we can quote a famous limerick regarding him. There was a young man who said, God must think it exceedingly odd if he finds that this tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad. Dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always in the quad, and that's why the tree will continue to be since observed by yours faithfully, God. In answer to the cliché question, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Berkeley's answer is a resounding yes. The sound still being an objective property despite the truth of idealism, and yet one understood in the mind of God. The scientific revolution not only unsettled the findings of religion and theology, but of philosophy as well. The divergent ontologies of idealism versus materialism, as well as the divergent epistemologies of rationalism versus empiricism, created the conditions in the modern period for enormous new philosophical achievement, and yet no new complete synthesis or system of philosophy had yet been able to reconcile and integrate the profusion of competing philosophies and philosophical methods. The Enlightenment inherited enormous advances in human knowledge, and the task now was to evolve beyond our own self-imposed immaturity within particular philosophical or religious systems of the world, and to dare to have the courage and resolve for our own understanding, to read not only traditional materials, but as well all the new findings of the various sciences, and thereby to usher in a new enlightened age. It is against this backdrop that David Hume presents his skeptical empiricist philosophical project. Although David Hume is often misconceived as an atheist or a thinker whose views lead to atheism, in fact, his skeptical empiricism frequently displays enormous sympathies for religious sentiment. As Hobbes wanted to become the Galileo of human nature, Hume wanted to become the Newton of human nature, to use Newtonian principles to understand human beings and especially their minds. As an Enlightenment thinker, Hume is hostile to superstition and dogmatism, but not to sublimely well-considered traditions of faith. Hume's empiricist epistemology inherits a lot from Locke, but also refines Lockean definitions. Perceptions like in Locke are to be divided into two kinds, impressions and ideas. Impressions again are livelier, more forceful, vivacious than ideas. Hume's example is the experience of pain versus the memory of pain. The experience is always greater. One of the upshots here is that not even the most beautiful and colorful poetry can paint the full impression of a lovely landscape. I'm not so sure here because it could be in turn that the loveliness of the landscape cannot be fully impressed in the human mind without poetic ideas with which to frame it. In any case, both impressions and ideas can be simple or complex. Example, the complex idea of a golden mountain consists of two simple ideas, gold and mountain. An actual golden mountain would be a complex impression. Hume also recognizes the enormous import in human experience of the faculty of imagination as the productive ground of human thought. Nothing is more unbounded than the thought of man. The human imagination can form monsters and incongruous shapes and is not restrained within the limits of nature and reality. The imagination errs because it exceeds reality, which can be very pleasing indeed. Hume himself was possessed of a very forceful and vivid imagination, often writing in a very evocative style and well-versed in innumerable subjects much closer to history and the humanities than to philosophy. Precisely by being so imaginatively well-endowed, 
Hume qualified himself to speak of the limits of imagination. All our thoughts are compositions of experience. All complex ideas and complex impressions therefore resolve for Hume into simple ideas and simple impressions. It is by analyzing our complex ideas and complex impressions into simpler elements that we can purify the human mind of the monsters of fantasy, superstition, and dogmatism. So when we're doing philosophy, the task is to bring ideas back to impressions. For every idea, we must ask, from what impression is that supposed idea derived? And echoing Hobbes here rather than Locke, for Hume, God, soul, immortality, and freedom are complex ideas, but meaningless ones, at least when it comes to their basis in sensible impressions. Hume's fork is the most sophisticated system yet for distinguishing between a priori and a posteriori cognition. That is what we know independently of experience versus that which we know on the basis of sense impressions. Ideas are both related to each other and to the impressions from which they derive. When ideas relate to each other purely, we know them through intuition and demonstration. Knowledge is attainable in understanding the way ideas are themselves related when we approach them analytically with a view to certainty. The truth 2 plus 2 is 4 is a priori independent of experience, certain or demonstrable, as well as analytic. That is based purely on conceptual analysis. The negation of this truth would imply a contradiction. And so there is for Hume a kind of knowledge which is based on the relation of ideas or thought alone, without reference to external reality. The knowledge derived from relations of ideas can be very important, but even more important and practical is knowledge concerning matters of fact, that is, objective states of affairs in the physical world. Such matters are known through experience and observation. They are a posteriori, dependent on experience, uncertain, unprovable. The negation of a matter of fact does not imply a contradiction, and synthetic, that is based on the association of ideas in the world. This all seems very abstract, but it's actually quite practical. What would you say if I told you that the sun will not rise tomorrow? You'd say, that's ludicrous, of course you know it will rise. But what if overnight while you were sleeping, some chance occurrence in the universe occurred such that the earth was sent hurtling out of its orbit, and when you woke the next day, there was no sun to be seen in the sky? Or what if a tiny black hole or singularity formed in the sun and caused it simply to disappear, to collapse into nothing? Such events are highly improbable, but not inconceivable. Hume's point is that every time we make a claim regarding a matter of fact in the world, we cannot do so on the basis of relation of ideas alone. Every claim regarding a matter of fact requires empirical verification and observation, and even repeated or regular occurrence is subject to change in principle. That the sun has risen every day all your life and all of human history is no principled argument that it will continue to do so in the future. The proposition itself that the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible than the proposition that it will. Now whenever we are thinking about relations of ideas or matters of fact, we are associating ideas. And for Hume, ideas are associated in three principal ways. Through resemblance, contiguity in place and time, and cause and effect. When ideas are associated through resemblance, we can speak of similarities, differences, analogies, and proportions. But this doesn't really provide us with a very helpful or useful form of knowledge. When a professor asks you to compare and contrast, the process that ensues is more associative than deliberative and demonstrative. In this way, Hume demotes the entire system of resemblance or thought based on the idea of likeness or similarity from Plato through Aquinas. A second way in which ideas can be associated is as contiguity in place or time. If I evoke the idea of your childhood home, you will likely be able to form vivid mental images of contiguous places within it. Both these ways in which ideas are associated are not very useful for producing certain knowledge. It is the relation of cause and effect that is most important for science and knowledge concerning matters of fact. Here we associate the idea of cause with the idea of effect through regular conjunction of event A and event B. Aristotle had explained causality in terms of a fourfold process. We can use here the example of a silver chalice. The material cause is the matter or the silver out of which the chalice is made. The formal cause is the form of chaliceness. The efficient cause in this case is the silversmith who made the chalice. And the final cause is the ritual, in which the chalice fulfills its purpose as a chalice. Although this example derives from the realm of technically fabricated beings, 
it is applied by Aristotle to all beings in nature as well. The modern scientific understanding of causality or the relation of cause and effect focuses in mostly on the efficient cause, dispensing with the interconnection of content and form, as well as suspending the idea of final causes. Hume's understanding of the relation of cause and effect derives like the scientific understanding from the efficient cause alone. Our experience of external nature consists in a continuum of discrete events. When we isolate certain events from others in the continuum of our experience, according to our impressions and the ideas we form from them, then we speak of what caused those events. This is more a powerful force of custom and habit than it is a relation of ideas. We imagine that the causal relationship exists in the object. And this is the point of view from which scientific discoveries in fact occur. It took experience to discover that two smooth pieces of marble will adhere to each other. And in general, we do not see into the secret inner structure of parts in natural objects. That water might drown us is known not by reason, but through experience. And even that one billiard ball, when hitting another, will move it in turn, would be an arbitrary presupposition if we did not, by custom and habit, have some experience of the laws of motion. Nothing in principle prevents the laws of motion from being very different. The first billiard ball could have very well bounced off the other one. So causality, or the relation of cause and effect, is for Hume far from being a demonstrable relation of ideas in the mind. We infer the relation of cause and effect through the experience of constant conjunction of similar events A producing similar events B, and we call one the cause and the other the effect according to the temporal order of before and after. There is no necessary connection of the idea of cause and effect. Ultimately, there is simply the event. The upshot here is that our knowledge of nature is far more limited for Hume than has been presupposed. Note Hume is not saying that there is no necessary causality in nature itself, i.e. that there are no observable laws of nature. There clearly seem to be. But he is saying that our knowledge of natural causality is based on inductive inferences, not demonstrative reason. And he's also saying that our knowledge of causality can never therefore be 100% certain. Where does this leave science in Hume's empiricist epistemology? Pretty much exactly where it is. Hume's doctrine of a lack of necessary connection between the ideas of cause and effect is far from anti-science, but rather promotes a humbler and more attentive empiricist science based on inductive inference from the observation of nature rather than preordained conclusions about the essential properties of things. The new science Hume envisions is based on probability, not necessary connection. And in a way, quantum physics has proven Hume's epistemology correct. Events that seem extremely impossible to us, such as gravity no longer working, are very inferior and improbable chances, but they nevertheless remain possible events. Hume concludes that we should be more skeptical in the realm of epistemology and metaphysics if we want to approach life with an open mind, as well as make advances in science. Hume also further develops Locke's bundle theory of personal identity, and famously reconciles freedom with determinism, so long as we don't think of freedom as simply being unconstrained or unhindered, free to do whatever we want and transcend the causality inherent in nature, rather understand freedom as itself a certain kind of causation embedded in a deterministic universe. In his dialogues concerning natural religion and other popular treatises on the origin and nature of religion, Hume critiques the ontological and cosmological argument, as well as the arguments from design and divine providence. God's existence cannot be proven by relying on relations of ideas, since these never entail any matters of fact that we know from experience and critiquing the cosmological argument God cannot be proved a posteriori either by relying on causality and the first cause or unmoved mover, that the existence of God cannot be proved definitively through the relation of ideas or through the analysis of matters of fact, does not mean it is unreasonable to believe in God on the grounds of faith or as a probable inference. Hume's own position on the existence of God and other religious questions in his dialogues concerning natural religion might be inferred to have been most closely modeled on the ancient academic skeptical position and Cicero's text on the nature of the gods. Like the ancient skeptics, Hume does not foreclose religious experience or revelation or the possibility that some position or other in the history of philosophy and philosophical theology might be correct, but rather suspends particular commitments for the sake of promoting free human inquiry.
Within all these developments going on in modern philosophy simultaneously and in succession over two centuries, Baruch Spinoza and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz probably emerge as the rationalist philosophers most qualified to speak both to the new science and to the historico-philosophical traditions, respectively, of Judaism and Christianity. Spinoza constructed a comprehensive metaphysical and epistemological system within an ethics and a theological politics. Because he was a pantheist, believing in an immanent God as one with nature, just expressed differently in terms of attributes and modes, he was reviled as an atheist. And the Spinoza controversy became in the later history of philosophy synonymous with heresy. A Jewish thinker living in Amsterdam, Spinoza was well versed in Jewish religious and philosophical traditions, but excommunicated at 24 and became a lens grinder. His theologico-political treatise argued for free inquiry, tolerance, religious liberty, and open-minded biblical criticism, but was condemned and banned by the Reformed Church. His greatest work, The Ethics, realizes Descartes' geometrical model for philosophical demonstration and was published posthumously and is still enormously influential. In answer to the question, what is being, what is fundamental reality, Descartes had identified two substances, material and mental. Spinoza argued there is only one substance, God or nature, undergoing infinite attributes and modes, and that since everything exists by necessity, absolute freedom is an illusion, even for God. Relative freedom does exist, however, insofar as God or human beings act in accordance with their own natures. Humans flourish when they cultivate a maximum of active or joyful passions rather than passive and sad affects and when they cultivate their rational faculties into the perceiving attributes and modes of God, or nature. Spinoza is taken as so controversial by both Jewish and Christian communities at the time, probably because he naturalizes the God of the Old Testament. The list of major philosophers who owe a fundamental debt to Spinoza after him is endless. Goethe, Hegel, Nietzsche, and 20th century French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, who called Spinoza the prince of philosophy, all stand out. Leibniz was another great rationalist philosopher and Christian thinker with a metaphysical and epistemological system of substance, as well developed from Descartes but diametrically opposed to Spinoza's. He was a polymath with accomplishments in mathematics such as the invention of the calculus around the same time as Newton, jurisprudence, history, politics, theology, science, and technology. While Descartes believed in two substances and Spinoza one, Leibniz proposed an infinite number. His simple substances are the basic units, atoms, or what he calls monads that compose complex substances. They are, however, more like souls than tiny bits of matter. Monads are differentiated according to the degree of consciousness, although each monad is a microcosmic mirror of the entire cosmos. Monads are windowless, meaning that nothing can enter or leave them. They behave according to pre-established harmony laid down by God from eternity. God may incline or will one way or another, but does not necessitate our wills. Determinism and free will thus coexist in human action and choices. God also has free will which he uses to select among possible worlds, the best possible world, which is our own for Leibniz. This leads Leibniz to the problem of theodicy. How can this be the best world when it is so full of evil and imperfection? The evil and imperfection in the world are necessary, says Leibniz, to preserve a greater good that is, human freedom. Leibniz's world is a strange and almost idealist one, in which each individual substance, our monad, may appear to be in connection with others, but is actually isolated in all eternity. Interacting with the presence of other things and minds, only within its own windowless interiority and projective reconstruction of everything else. The perceptions of monads are more or less clear and distinct depending on how well they develop their rational faculties and furnish their baroque interiors in accordance with God and Christ's harmonious intelligible reality. In a way, the monadology is Leibniz's Christological response to Spinoza's pantheism. It remains today a strange and experimental metaphysics, neither provable nor disprovable but endlessly fascinating. Indeed, it would probably be fair to say that other than Hume's skeptical empiricism, the rationalist systems of Leibniz and Spinoza have had the most impact on the development of the history of philosophy among the early to late moderns. Okay, that's a wrap. I hope you've enjoyed your video. Next up, Kant. 
completes modern philosophy by taking on board all these thinkers and provides a new philosophical synthesis and critical system.